the first thing that you're drawn to is, is his 1v1 ability, his elusiveness, his tremendous amount of ball control and skill at a high speed. A name that's obviously instantly recognizable to U.S. soccer fans. U.S. men's national team manager Greg Berhalter joins us. Obviously, this is Chelsea mic'd up, so we would not be doing our due diligence if we didn't lead off with the obvious contractually obligated Christian Pulisic question. Greg, uh, what do you make of Christian's season so far? Obviously, he was trying to get on the field, and there was a bit of an acclimation point. And then he had a run of really good form, and then bitten by some injuries that have sort of followed him throughout his career. But in a macro sense, what do you make of his season so far with Chelsea Football Club? So, you know, I think first and foremost, when, when he was moving from Dortmund to Chelsea, we knew there was going to be an ad adaptation period. And, um, you know, the, the Premier League is an extremely fast league, extremely physical league. Um, we knew there'd be um, time needed to get up to speed. And what I really like about how that season unfolded, particularly in the beginning, is that, you know, he had to endure adversity. He, to, he had to overcome um, struggle. He had to get used to the English game. And it took time. And as he did that, what you saw was, um, you know, he, he came out, um, you know, performing really well and helping the team and scoring goals and being influential. All of these things that we projected him being able to do, um, you know, and it just, it took a, a time period, an understandable amount of time. I think How much... When, Oh, I'm ahead. sorry. Go, no, no, no. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead and finish your thought. We'll clean it up. It was a long, a long winded answer. Sorry. No, 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 no. We appreciate I, I, the long winded. Yeah. I, I think then when you look, you, you know, when you go into this injury period that he had, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate because he was in such good form. And, you know, the next part of it is, um, you know, him dealing with a serious injury. Uh, you know, he was in a lot of pain. It, it was a serious injury. I think it was, um, you know, the, the timeline wasn't exactly clear of when he can come back. And I think, um, you know, fans wanted him back, but understandably it was, it was a difficult injury to come back to um, in that short amount of time. Was there any discussion before Christian made the decision? And obviously these transfers, they're, they're months in the making, sometimes even longer than that. Was there any discussion between Christian and, the, and U.S. soccer uh, about this decision he was going to make and what it meant for the men's national team? You know, I had just come in um, as coach when the decision was made already, but, you know, I, I certainly recapped his thought process going through it, and he re felt really comfortable with the decision of going to Chelsea. Um, he felt like he'd be in really good hands. He felt like it was a squad that was, that was developing and that had a lot of potential. So he felt very good about the move to Chelsea. Uh, for the audience, I think I know your position on this, but – Obviously, Jurgen Klinsmann made a very public effort to force players into Europe, often Germany, thinking that it, it took precedence and it was the best possible thing for their career. Where do you stand on U.S. men's national team players and where they play, the leagues that they decide to put their roots down in and resume their careers in? So, you know, what I encourage players to do is um, to follow their individual pathway. And I want them to always be challenged with the level that they're playing at. I think that's very important for development of our players. So for some players, their maximum level is going to be one, one league. And for other players, the maximum level is going to be another, another league. And I think it's very important that the guys find levels that are going to challenge them but they're also going to be playing because it doesn't do us any good to have our players um, sitting on the bench, not playing if they're in, um, you know, a, a great league. You know, we need them on the field performing, getting challenged and improving and, and developing. Now the club that Christian Pulisic stepped into is a little bit different than what the club is now. Are you almost more encouraged by the fact that Chelsea are now incorporating younger players and a more building towards a future than really narrowing on the present, which has really been their modus operandi for 15 years? It, it is a different Chelsea than we're used to seeing. Um, and I think it, it's interesting how, how they're, what they're doing. I think it's interesting that they're still able to get results. Um, they've done a great job of that w with a young team. I think they have a very athletic team. I think it's, um, you know, some exciting players in, in key positions. Um, and, and to me, it's been fun to watch. I think Christian has quality that he could adapt, um, you know, with a more experienced team as well. But I think this is, you know, there's a lot of room for these players to grow. There's a lot of room for development, and, um, and he's in a good spot. A lot has been made about 
about how the U.S. men's national team uses Christian and, and what he's best suited for on the national team and how that may at times conflict with club. If you had your way, would you prefer a consistent position for nation and club for Christian Pulisic or whatever? He seems as though he'll do whatever it takes to help that team win. He's fairly versatile that way. But if Greg Berhalter had a say in it, what would you prefer? Yeah, you know, again, I, I think sometimes we get hung up with positions, you know, because I look at some of his best actions for Chelsea and he's central and he's playing the ball behind the line or he's combining and making things happen in a central position, but moving inside from a winger. So, like, I, I think it's, you know, there's no question both Chelsea and, and us want him affecting the game. We want to put him in position to hurt the opponent. And sometimes that's going to be wide. Sometimes that's going to be central. But, you know, starting positions to me, I think sometimes we get too hung up on. One of the things that we spoke to him about back when we saw him over the winter was Chris and I have really been talking about how Christian is so instinctual. He just always seems to be at the right place, especially when he's at peak form. He, he very much is a, a rhythm player. And when he's out there, he's locked in in a way that not many other players can be, especially for U.S. soccer. Is that something that can be coached? Or is this just DNA? Is this, is this just refined? Is this genetics, really? What's going on with Christian Pulisic and his uh, in instincts? Yeah, you know, that's a great point. And I think that, um, to me, that isn't something that you coach. That is something that he has through him, his ability to read the game. But that's, all, that's what makes him special. And that's what makes it also sometimes difficult because he is such an instinct player. So really? you, you have to give him the freedom as a coach to, to be instinctual. And you can't take that away from him by giving him too much structure to play with him. I never thought of it uh, like that. Can you articulate a, a little bit more? Because I could see where it could be maybe a bad thing because he might find himself in a position that you're not exactly game planning for. Can you describe that a little bit more? Well, part of it is he has such an ability to, 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 to operate in space. He has such a good understanding of how space opens up and where to attack space. And, and sometimes that leads him to, to leaving his position, which if you play a strict positional game, then you're going to have problems with that. Because what that means is now, say, for example, he's playing left wing and he's drifted into the middle and your fullback's not high to occupy the left back now it can cause you know it can cause him to be easily marked right so you need you need this interchange when he leaves his space but what i think is you know what what i've learned is you want to take advantage of the quality you have and as coaches we need to adapt for for when you have that high level of quality we need to adapt to them and when you look at the way that he's sort of grown as a player from when he first started at Dortmund, you know, he was, tell, he was talking to us about how he was scouted to go to Dortmund at a time when he wasn't really expecting it. What would you say has most grown about his game? And you talk about some of the things that make him special. What are some of the things that make him right now one of America's greatest players? You know, the first thing that you're drawn to is his 1v1 ability, his elusiveness, his tremendous amount of ball control and skill at a high speed. Uh, you don't see that very often in players, that he just has that much control moving at such a high pace. He actually sometimes, you don't realize how fast he's actually moving with the ball because he makes it look effortless. So I think that's a, that's an, a real big quality of his. The second thing I'd say that he's really improved on that, that I've seen this year is his finishing ability, you know, his ability to put the ball in the back of the net. He's done a great job of that. And it's something that, you know, the, the high level players, when you look at the top players in the world, they're able to score, um, you know, a big number of goals because they have that finishing quality. I want to ask you a little bit about some of the um, obstacles that uh, this particular pandemic presents as a national team manager. We've gotten into detail on this podcast a little bit about steps that the club has been taking to make sure that their players are fit if there is ever a return to some sort of football. A lot of people have understandably said the national teams take a back seat. What are you doing as a national team manager to keep tabs on some of your players, to gauge their fitness? Is there any sort of actual coaching up? that has happened during this uh, sort of uh, sabbatical from football? So we're, we're that second level, right? Where you have the clubs being the first level of support and we're the second level. And what we're doing um, is we're, we're looking at the programs. We're seeing if there's any gaps in the programs. We're seeing how we can supplement them in any way, but just giving the player support. 
So, you know, we've been in communication with all the players, uh, figuring out what they're doing and how we can help, whether they need equipment, whether they need advice on, on supplements, whether they need advice on um, actual workouts or, or some ideas, you know, we're, we're there to help the players. Um, the other thing we're doing with some of the younger guys is we are going through video and we are showing them positional profile videos and, and getting them up to speed with how we play. Um, but we just, we're just here to support them. You know, it's a tough time for everyone in the world right now and as, as supportive as we can be, that, that's how we're going to help them. It's an interesting dynamic being a national team manager, especially with a player of Christian Zilk. There was a, a friendly in which he, he, had, he was carrying over a knock for, that he picked up at Chelsea and you guys held him out of a match. How much discussion is there between club and country in terms of a player's fitness? Frank Lampard has sort of gotten into a public spat with uh, the French Football Federation over how they use N'Golo Kante and how he desperately is obviously looking for a healthy N'Golo Kante. And he seems to be picking up knocks. Can you describe how that relationship works for the U.S. men's national team manager? Well, we need to work together. And um, we both need to understand that the player is important for, for both of us, right? He's not just important for the club and he's not just important for the country. And I think when you have that type of um, collaboration and, um, you know, you generally are able to make decisions that make sense for the player, you know, and I think that's the most important thing is that you collaborate to make the best possible decision um, for the player. You never want to put a player at risk. But in the same sense, you, you understand that he has, you know, he does have dual obligations, especially when he's electing and, and he wants to play for the national team, you know. And so, you know, they're, they're always tricky situations. You know, I understand that the clubs are paying him a lot of money, a lot more money than we're paying him. But it, it's, you know, he, he loves playing for the national team in this and he wants to play for the national team. So it's just about working together, for the, making the best decision. There's another player in the Chelsea setup that is also with Chelsea in a broader level at the moment. That's Matt Miazga, who's on loan to Reading. Um, he's gone through a few loan spells. In general, uh, he's progressed somewhat since moving to Chelsea in 2016. But uh, what do you want to see from him as a next step? You know, Matt, it's about rhythm. It's about consistency. It's about playing, you know, week in and week out, being in, in an environment that's going to keep challenging him. And, you know, we've seen some good things from him um, in, this, in this, last, this last phase with Reading. Uh, he's done a great job. You know, he came back from an ankle injury and, and was able to, to work his way into the lineup. And he's been performing well. You know, one thing you forget about Matt is he's still a young player and he's still developing. So for him, it's about, you know, the, the consistency of playing time and, you know, and continue to use each and every game to, to, improve, um, to improve his level. I can't imagine a better person to ask this, and it's a better resource. Chris knows where I'm going with this. I'm a little bit older in terms of I've been watching football a little bit longer than Chris. So when I started watching the U.S. men's national team, they were this, you know, gutsy underdog that was just counterattacking, playing what most would consider ugly football games, but finding a way, you know, better than anybody, to go on these runs and get some results that you weren't really expecting but it wasn't very appealing to the eye. You're trying to come in now as the national team manager and play a, a, comp, a, a complex style of football that doesn't really mesh with that sort of underdog counterattacking style. I've always maintained, and this is just a bar discussion that I'm bringing you in on, that if you have players less than the club team, maybe it makes a little bit more sense to play an uglier style of football because it's so complex and you have these players for a limited time. Can you speak on some of the challenges and if you agree with me, coach? <laughs> no, I think, that's a, I think that's a good point. And I think when you look at international soccer, a lot of times you see countries that um, are, are relying on their quality, right? They, they have, um, you know, they wait for the opponent to give them the ball back. And when they get the ball, they do their thing and they have more quality to end up to winning the games. A great example of that is France winning the World Cup, right, in, in 2018. Um, you know, they have very – a very small amount of the ball, but they had the quality. When they won the ball back, they're able to counterattack or create attacks that ended up in goals, and they're very efficient with their with their chances, and they won the World Cup. Any country would take winning the World Cup, right? The, the, yes. We're not complaining about that. So I think there is that side of it. Now, the second part of your question, or maybe it was the first part, but I mixed it up, is, um, you know, I believe that we have quality players. I believe that we have a very young group of players with a high potential. 
and we want to try something different with them. We want to give them more confidence. We want to, we want to let them know they can dominate games. Now, does that mean we're going to go dominate the game against Brazil? Probably not. But there's a whole bunch of other opponents that we can, we can be very effective against playing the way we want to play. And my job as a coach is to be able to teach it in a, in a simple enough way that we can be effective um, with having the lack of time that you mentioned. So it, it's a challenge. I think, um, you know, when you talk to players and you ask them how they want to play and, and what they're comfortable in, they, you know, this is a brand of football that's appealing to play, right? Um, so it, proactive, wanting to have the ball, wanting to disorganize the opponent, wanting to score goals, and, um, and we'll get there. It, it, it will take time, but we're going to get there. How hey, much? Girl, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. How much of the growth of the U.S. player almost necessitates that? That you need to sort of have from the top down uh, a, a organizational philosophy of, well, we, we need to go and attack other teams because ultimately the quality of U.S. players won't grow unless the national team and the national setup wants that to happen. I think that's a good point. And, you know, I never really looked at it like that, but that is the next step as your player pool is improving. You need to challenge them more and put them into situations where they, you know, they, uh, they need to apply their skill. Greg Berhalter, I can't thank you enough for the time that you've spent with us. One last thing before we go. It came up in our research. When I hear the name Torsten Frings, a chill goes down my spine. Do you have that very same reaction? Because in the research, you're responsible sort of for that entire moment. Lord knows what conversations we could be having about U.S. soccer if certain things are called the way that they're supposed to be. Yeah, you know, I think there, there's, again, there's always two sides, right? And the, the one side is I also uh, think to myself, if I would have struck the ball better, he never would have had a chance to put his hand on it. It would have went directly in. So, that, you know, I, I remember just gambling and, and thinking Tony's going to get his head on it. And if I can just gamble enough, it, it will come to me. And it was a little bit out of my reach, and I wasn't able to make the best contact. Nonetheless, it was going on goal, and, and Torsten Frings did what he was trained to do his whole life. You know, if the ball's there, you know, you, you want to prevent it from going in your own goal. And, you know, to me, it's, it's more of a, a referee decision. I think it's more of, you know, lack of um, quality refereeing, and, and, and it, it, it hurts, right? We would have been in a different position, but it is what it is. Now, you know, we'll use the next World Cup and the next upcoming World Cups to try to get in the semifinals. You heard Greg Berhalter, Torsten Frings, enemy of this state. Can't thank you enough. The manager of the U.S. men's national team. Hopefully we can catch up with you down the line. Uh, we wish you nothing but success because we're obviously huge men's national team fans as well. So thank you so much, Coach. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me.